This is Matt Graybaugh. I'm a science coordinator with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service Science Applications Program. This is the third in a series of webinars on non-native aquatic species, and this is in support of the Southwest Non-Native Aquatic Species Community of Practice. Today, Audrey Owens is going to be presenting to us on efforts to recover native Chiricahua leopard frogs in Arizona. Audrey's worked on amphibian and reptile conservation since 2007 and currently coordinates the Ranid Frogs Project with Arizona Game and Fish. The Ranid Frogs Project manages and supports conservation of Chiricahua leopard frogs and other native frogs, partnerships that include the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and other federal, state, university, and private organizations and individuals. If you have any questions for Audrey during the presentation, as we mentioned, please enter those in the chat box. And with that, I will turn it over to Audrey for her presentation. All right, thank you, Alex and Matt. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can hear you. Perfect. So I'm gonna go ahead and um, get into my slides here. Um, so for those of you who may not be amphibian biologists, um, as Alex said, uh, my position here at Game and Fish is the Ranid Frogs Project Coordinator. And the term Ranid refers to um, a family of frogs, commonly called true frogs. Um, they tend to be large, highly aquatic frogs and include things like leopard frogs and bullfrogs. So as um, Alex said, this is a webinar series that is focused on non-native aquatic species, but Today, I'll be presenting on the recovery program for the Chiricahua leopard frog, which I may be referring to as CLF throughout the program. Um, and uh, this is because we have a non-native management um, program integrated into the conservation of this native threatened aquatic species. And I do want to mention um, my co-author on this talk, um, Kat Crawford. She's the species lead for Chiricahua leopard frogs for U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And she and I work closely together on management of this species. Um, and among other roles that she has, she's been really integral in acquiring and managing the funding for a lot of the bullfrog work that I'm gonna be talking about today. Okay, so regarding the title of the talk, the, uh, the Bumpy Dirt Road to Recovery. I thought Bumpy Dirt Road was an appropriate metaphor. Um, to recovery for this species because we have made a lot of significant, we still have several bumps in the road, um, including continued non-native species control and several um, unanswered applied research questions that we have. Also, uh, quite literally, we do log a lot of hours on bumpy dirt roads here in Arizona. Um, for those of you that may be out of state, um, this is a photo showing um, a dirt road on the Clifton Ranger District of Apache Sit Greaves. Um, this photo was digitally enhanced. Um, those are, are uh, we don't normally see giant leopard frogs on a road like this, just FYI. Um, but I wanted to show you guys some of the terrain that we um, drive on to get to some of these really remote sites. Um, and this is by far the scariest road I've ever been on in Arizona. So um, I also want to acknowledge all of our partners. The, the Chiricahua Leopard Frog Recovery Program is um, a really uh, strong collaborative effort among many partners, including Game and Fish and Fish and Wildlife Service. Also a number of universities, uh, University of Arizona, NAU, and University of Minnesota Morris, as well as federal agencies, USGS, Bureau of Land Management, Forest Service, and the Phoenix Zoo is also um, a really big partner um, as far as the breeding program. Um, and I want to acknowledge the State Wildlife Grants Program and the um, Arizona Heritage Fund, with, which both fund the non-game program here at Arizona Game and Fish. And then this talk today will be focusing on Arizona work, but um, I want to um, shout out to our partners in New Mexico, the New Mexico Department of Game and Fish, Turner Endangered Species Fund, and the Fort Worth Zoo, who are all working towards um, conservation and management of the species in New Mexico. So natural history of the species, Chiricahua leopard frog or Rana chiricahuensis. They're named after the Chiricahua Mountains, which is where the holotype was collected and the species was, was described from, and that's the star that you see on the range map here. So they're found, as you can see, um, in uh, eastern um, and northern Arizona and western New Mexico along the Mullion Rim in the San Francisco and drainages. And then there's 
also a disjunct southern population, which is found in the Sky Islands of Arizona and the boot heel of New Mexico and makes its way down into Mexico in the Sierra Madre Occidental of Sonora, Durango, and Chihuahua. So they're a highly aquatic species. They can be found in lotic habitats and wetlands from about 1,000 meters to 2,700 meters elevation. And this slide is just to show you some of the variability um, in, in what they look like. They're generally a pretty stout bodied frog, get to about four inches in size. Um, and you can see they're green and brown. Um, characteristic of them are these spots on their back and the strong dorsolateral folds, which you see on either side of them. And then they also have pretty prominent upturned eyes. So Chiricahua leopard frogs, like many ranid frogs, live in metapopulations, basically um, small groupings of, of like subpopulations that are separated spatially. And dispersal or movement of frogs from one site to another is a really important mechanism of metapopulations. So while one individual site may be vulnerable to extirpation from um, a stochastic event like drought or disease, um, Having multiple occupied sites is important so that we can keep frogs on the ground in the landscape. And so these dispersals allow for persistence of the whole population. And so Chiricahua leopard frog subpopulations or sites are connected to each other via a drainage um, that has water in it or proximity. And we know that Chiricahua leopard frogs can disperse a mile or more over land um, in the monsoon season, particularly during a rain event. Um, and they can move even further than that if they're moving along a drainage. The reason we manage habitats um, in close proximity to each other. And these habitats um, may be quite varied. Um, so I've got some photos here on the right side of the slide. The top photo is a drainage or a canyon that has um, intermittent pools. Um, so this would be considered like a natural habitat, but we also take advantage of other artificial or human-made structures in the landscape. So stock tanks and other drinkers and things like that, um, that Chiricahua leopard frogs do use and can use them for breeding or even um, dispersal sites. So I want to get into the threats here to the species. A major threat being the fungal disease chytridiomycosis. Um, it's referred to commonly as BD, which is just the abbreviation of the scientific name. And um, the disease has caused, caused substantial declines in Chiricahua leopard frogs, as well as some other um, ranid frogs here in the Southwest. And we know it's been in Arizona as early as 1992 based on museum specimens, even though at that time we didn't know what BD was. Um, at this point, we presume that it's throughout the range of Chiricahua leopard frogs. Um, and oops, um, the disease is really a, a wintertime phenomenon here in the Southwest. So um, colder temperatures uh, makes better conditions for the fungus and it causes localized die-offs. Some populations may experience 100% mortality. Some other populations may experience mortality of, of just individuals or maybe just adults at that site. And interestingly, we do have some populations, particularly in Southern Arizona, that are persisting with BD, and we don't know why that is, whether it's genetic or something to do with the habitat or climate. Other threats include aquatic invasive species, of course, bullfrogs, which are established in um, large parts of Southern Arizona. Bullfrogs are competitors on Chiricahua leopard frogs as well as predators. Um, this bullfrog that you see on the screen was dissected and had a Mexican garter snake neonate in it, which is another native threatened species. Um, the bullfrog is a particular scourge because it also transmits amphibian diseases that they seem to be um, immune to, including BD. And then crayfish are established throughout um, many aquatic systems in Arizona, and again, um, represent predators and competitors with um, Chiricahua leopard frogs. And finally, um, a threats discussion wouldn't be complete without talking about habitat loss and degradation. In Arizona, this is represented by um, diversion and extraction of water, surface water and groundwater that negatively impacts streams and cienegas and other um, surface waters. Long-term drought 
um, drying out sites that were um, that were uh, held water for a long time, and catastrophic wildfire, which can lead to flooding and sedimentation um, and just degradation of water quality. So all of these threats are kind of working together um, uh, to cause loss and, and um, degradation of habitat. So because of these threats, um, by 2002, at the time the species was listed by U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service as threatened, we had lost up to 80% of our populations range wide. And the recovery plan was published in 2007, and this has really been our blueprint for conservation and management of the species. It outlined uh, many recovery tools that we still use. Um, it outlined four recovery criteria, and it designated eight recovery units, which are basically large geographic areas that um, represent the range of the species. And of these eight units, seven of them fall uh, partially or completely within Arizona. So for the next part of the talk, I'm going to I'm going to discuss our recovery approach and um, just, you know, quite obviously, our goal for the recovery program is to recover the species and delist it so it so that it no not no longer needs protection from um, the Endangered Species Act. The four recovery criteria are listed here. Um, so the first one is the one that is measurable, and that is that each recovery unit must have at least two meta populations and at least one isolated robust population, and these populations need to exhibit long-term stability. And then the other criteria are protection and management of aquatic breeding and dispersal habitats and reduction or elimination of threats. So I talked about the recovery tools that were outlined in the plan. Um, there were 12 of them, and they're referred to as like recovery um, strategy elements. But for this talk, I'm just gonna talk about five of them that we've been implementing in the last 15 years or so and have had success with. So that's the captive propagation and translocation program, bullfrog control, habitat restoration, our safe harbor agreement, and our monitoring program. The Captive Propagation and Translocation Program um, has been one of our most significant achievements towards recovery of the, the species. Um, it's reestablished extirpated populations and augmented declining populations on the ground in the wild. In Arizona, the Phoenix Zoo is our major partner, and they started their captive breeding and head starting program back in the mid-1990s. At that time, the focus was um, uh, trying to reduce the declines happening in the southern Arizona population of the species. Um, so we were really triaging to try to get more um, adult frogs and metamorphs onto the ground. Um, at this point, we do have a lot more stability in our southern Arizona CLF populations, and so we've moved to more wild-to-wild -wild egg mass translocations down there. So we're moving one or several egg masses from one wild site to another and managing populations that way. And that's allowed the Phoenix Zoo to focus more on um, uh, raising frogs for our northern recovery units, the so recovery units five, six, and seven here in Arizona. And we've had a more difficult time getting frogs established in the northern part of the range. So just as far as totals go, um, we've released, or we've done 440 releases or translocations at 157 sites. And again, this is since the mid 1990s, although most of these have been um, since the species was listed in 2002. And this includes 192 egg mass translocations or releases, over 30,000 tadpole releases, or tadpoles released, and nearly 18,000 frogs released or translocated. Most of these have been from the Phoenix Zoo, although again, some of these represent wild-to-wild -wild translocations. And so I think at this point, um, we think that this may be one of the largest amphibian reintroduction programs in the country, based on the numbers here. So moving into bullfrog control, um, bullfrog removal and control started on a smaller scale um, in the early 2000s, but in the last 10 years, we've moved to a larger scale effort, more of a landscape scale effort that now spans across the three recovery units in Southern Arizona. 
And this is an important milestone that I want to point out because it represents a shift away from triaging and trying to get frogs back on the ground in southern Arizona um, to a shift towards um, threat removal, which is one of the uh, recovery criteria. And this work requires an incredible amount of coordination among many partners, um, including Fish and Wildlife Service and Game and so University of Arizona. Um, David Hall has been leading um, a lot of these efforts in southern Arizona in the last 10 years. And um, I'm not going to get into too many of the details on bullfrog removal today as far as the methods, but um, he is going to be presenting in the same webinar series later this year. So he'll go into some of those details about the methods. Um, we also work with ranchers and private landowners. And um, I should mention that the removal effort also requires a great deal of funding. Um, and so far, the effort has been funded in large part by U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, the Forest Service, Bureau of Land Management, and Game and Fish. So the approach that we take is to try to remove and control bullfrogs from specific targeted removal areas. And we, we prioritize these sites based on the availability of, of otherwise suitable habitat, except for the bullfrogs, and the feasibility of control in these removal areas. So we look at aerial imagery, we assess where we have water on the ground, um, where there might be dispersal corridors for bullfrogs, and where there might be barriers on the landscape that we can use to our advantage. And then we do surveys, so we figure out where we have bullfrogs on the ground and where there are source populations where bullfrogs are breeding. And after we have the full-on assessment, the removal can begin, and this usually or this does require uh, repeat visits to sites to make sure that we have bullfrogs removed from the area. And you know, we first target the adult bullfrogs at those source populations where they're breeding. Um, and target juveniles to prevent dispersal. And the removal of frogs is done through shooting. We use a 22 rifle, as well as hand capture at night um, using like a spotlight. Um, for tadpoles, we use bag seines, which is what you see in the photo here and the, on the bottom right. So this is 30 foot bag seine. And you know, this is a really important component of bullfrog control and removal because we can remove literally thousands or tens of thousands of tadpoles from a site and prevent that recruitment. And this can happen in the off season, you know, in the winter and spring um, to prevent them from metamorphosing in the springtime. So after bullfrog removal, again, which can take several years, um, the, the project shifts towards uh, monitoring a buffer zone. And that buffer zone tends to be an area outside of the removal area, um, in between the removal area, and another like chunk of land that we um, maybe haven't targeted yet for bullfrog removal, or maybe we don't have access to because of a private landowner um, who's not interested in participating. And so um, the, the buffer zone monitoring is not as um, labor intensive as the removal effort, but it is a really important component because you want to make sure that bullfrogs don't invade or you've removed them um, and, and cause all of the success to be lost. Um, and so we have had um, quite a bit of success in controlling bullfrogs um, in these removal areas. Um, and the remarkable thing is that when bullfrogs have been removed, um, Chiricahua leopard frog populations, if there are any on the periphery, um, we've seen them actually dispersing back into these sites, which were once occupied by bullfrogs. Um, and so we've seen dispersals um, occupying areas across a 10 mile swath. So this is really a, a great success story as far as you know, the amount of work that goes into the bullfrog removal, but, um, but seeing the frogs recolonize on their own without the need for translocations. So this map um, is just showing Southern Arizona here. Um, so this is, uh, the top map is from 2001 and the bottom map is from 2019. And this map is courtesy of David Hall from U of A. Um, but it's showing an approximation of uh, where we had bullfrogs distributed as well as Chiricahua leopard frogs. And that's the, the light green polygons before the bullfrog removal efforts. And then um, last year. 
So what I want to point out here is recovery units one, two, and three, we've had active bullfrog removal um, projects going on. And you can see that Chiricahua leopard frog populations have expanded. Now, recovery units two and three, um, um, the leopard frog populations have benefited from reintroductions or augmentations that we've done. But in recovery unit one, um, the Chiricahua leopard frog populations have expanded on their own without the need for translocations. And so um, next I'm going to talk about a particular case study um, of a bullfrog removal project in recovery unit one um, where that star is on the screen. So this is um, a, the Pina Blanca Lake um, case study. And so you see in the center of the map is Pina Blanca Lake, which is a pretty large lake. It's a big sport fishery in southern Arizona, and it was a significant source of bullfrogs. Um, in 2009, the U.S. Forest Service drained the lake as part of a mercury uh, remediation project. And, you know, we knew that that was coming. And so we took advantage of the fact that the lake was going to be drained, source of bullfrogs was going to be removed. And so we started um, assessing where we had bullfrogs on the landscape in a five mile radius of the lake. And so what you see on the screen is um, the we visited and found no bullfrogs, but the red dots are those stock tanks that did have bullfrogs. So we had um, at least 16 sites that had bullfrogs. Um, and so over the course of the next two years, we did a removal effort um, and were able to successfully remove bullfrogs from the vicinity of Pena Blanca Lake. So at this point, we, um, we have one site here in the northeast um, corner of the map where we do have bullfrogs that come in um, pretty regularly. Um, we think that the source is likely the community here, which is um, Rio Rico. There's some golf courses here. So there's a connection, um, a dispersal connection um, where bullfrogs can get a donor here that owns the stock tank is, um, has generously given us permission to access his site on a regular basis. We go in um, two or three times a year to remove bullfrogs so that they don't get back into our system here. So prior to the bullfrog removal effort, this is what our Chiricahua leopard frog populations look like in this area. Um, so the green dots are Chiricahua leopard frog populations. We had seven. And then uh, the red circles around those green dots are sites that also had bullfrogs. And following the removal effort, we had Chiricahua leopard frog populations expand to 20 sites in the vicinity. And so, um, again, I think this is a great success story showing what the removal effort can do. Um, and this is not the only area where we've seen this happen. There are other areas in Recovery Unit 1 where we've seen a really similar pattern. Um, so this is kind of a strategy of if you build it, they will come. If you build the habitat, the Chiricahua leopard frogs will come back on their own. Habitat restoration is another recovery tool that we use. Um, so suitable Chiricahua leopard frog habitat is not just in our, our natural water systems, but also um, artificial structures like stock tanks. And, you know, stock tanks are advantageous to use because they're abundant and they're widely distributed on the landscape. Um, as long as they hold permanent water and they don't have non-native species, and they can really contribute to um, creating those metapopulation dynamics that we're looking for. So in the last 10 years, we worked with many partners to um, improve permanency of water at these stock tanks and complexity. Um, and it's not, it's not just with stock tanks, but also other bodies of water um, like springs and, um, and wetlands and even riparian areas. And so we've, um, we've improved habitat at almost um, three dozen sites in the last 10 plus years. The photos um, are showing a site in, in southern Arizona. Um, you can see that during the construction, um, there's heavy machinery um, and you know, the site uh, appears to get um, torn up pretty bad, but um, we tend to do this work in May, June when it's dry. Um, the bottom photo is the same site um, just two months later after the monsoon started. So you can see the site filled up quickly with water um, vegetation grew around it, and you would never know that it was a construction site just a couple months previously. This work has been in partnership with um, Wetland Restoration and Training and Bat Conservation International, 
um, U.S. Forest Service, as well as um, uh, Bureau of Land Management. And I wanted to show you um, just one particular restoration that we did recently. This was in 2018 in Recovery Unit 5. Um, we had a riparian corridor that had been a stronghold for frogs, but was no longer holding water because of sedimentation and erosion. So um, wetland restoration and training came in and created three pools, and we built a pipe rail fence around the site to prevent cattle trespass. And um, the funding for this project came from the Arizona Elk Society, which I think is important to point out because the um, you know, creation of water on the landscape is not just important for frog habitat, but for other species as well. Um, and so we were able to um, reintroduce frogs back into the site later that year. And at this point, we have a breeding population of frogs at the site. A safe harbor agreement is another tool that we use. This is with private landowners um, who may have um, aquatic habitat on their land. Um, and, and maybe adjacent to an area where we're doing frog recovery. And so we want to reduce their concerns about the potential of getting chirk oliver frogs on their property. And so um, it basically protects them from incidental take if they agree to specific conservation measures, which generally include um, maintaining that aquatic habitat on their property. Um, we also have many safe harbor participants that are really actively involved in conservation and want to create habitat on their property that wasn't there before. Um, so these are really helping us create more occupied sites on the landscape and contributing to meta populations. So at this point, we have 24 participants enrolled um, with nearly 66,000 acres covered. And so this is private land as well as um, state land. Monitoring isn't so much a recovery tool, but it is something that we use to assess where we are. Um, so we perform standard visual encounter surveys and we document the presence of Chiricahua leopard frogs. We document if they're breeding in a site. Um, we go to new sites to figure out if frogs have dispersed there. Um, and we can also assess habitat and figure out if there are emerging threats like non-native species. All of the monitoring data go into a centralized database that's housed by um, Game and Fish, and we've got over 12,000 surveys with time. And these data are used by our local recovery groups, which meet on an annual basis, um, to prioritize where we want to do translocations or um, improve habitat, um, or maybe um, uh, do some non-native species removal. We also use the data for our annual report um, and for tracking progress towards recovery. So as far as our current status, um, it's been 18 years since the species was listed. Um, overall, the status has improved, particularly in Arizona, um, where we've benefited from having um, really active management from the state and many other partners. Um, in New Mexico, there have been fewer resources um, towards conservation and management, um, and disease has really affected populations a little bit more drastically there. Um, so in New Mexico, the status, like they have um, lost several populations over the years, but they've also um, gained uh, or discovered populations that weren't known about at the time of listing. And then in Mexico, the status remains unknown. So these maps are just showing kind of um, what we know of occupied sites in Arizona over time. So in 2002, we had 26 sites, and you can see over time to 2019, we now have 135 sites that we know of that are occupied. And this number does go up and down um, each year as our survey effort changes or particularly dry years. Um, but overall, it's it's between a four and five fold increase in the number of occupied sites since listing, suggesting that we are on track. So I'm gonna zoom in here to the Galero Mountains in recovery unit four and show you how um, releases can result in a, a meta population. So again, this is the, the Galero Mountains where um, in 2012, um, this portion of the Galera Mountains um, uh, were considered extirpated um, for Chiricahua leopard frogs. And between 2012 and 2014, 
we released um, just over 300 frogs and five egg masses into one stock tank, which is the site that you see in the middle there of the 2012 map. Um, and over time, frogs dispersed from that site north and south. Um, and by 2019, we had frogs occupying um, 14 sites across a 15 kilometer swath. Um, and the number of occupied sites did go down between 2018 and 2019 um, because 2019 was a per year um, in this mountain range. But, um, you know, we feel that this is a, a functioning meta populations. Um, and so um, that allows for um, sites to become extirpated. And, um, you know, we hope that as um, they fill back up with water, um, those frogs, will, fr those sites will become occupied again. And I want to point out that these dispersals um, in the Galeros are likely happening mostly over land. It is a, a pretty dry mountain range. There are some intermittent drainages, but, um, but these are mostly stock tanks. And so these frogs are moving over land to disperse from one site to another. So where are we as far as our um, recovery criteria? Um, at this point, um, despite you know, a lot of progress that we've made, um, we do only have one recovery unit in Arizona that meets that criterion of having at least two meta populations and one isolated robust population. So this map is actually from 2018, um, but we have two um, meta populations circled in blue and then the one isolated robust population. Um, I do um, wanna say though that we have um, meta populations going in recovery units two, three, four and five. So we've got breeding sites and we've got dispersals happening and we're working towards more meta populations in these areas. Okay, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the challenges that we have and these mostly pertain to research questions that we have. Some of them we're already trying to address. Um, Disease is, is still a major challenge, particularly um, chytridium mycosis. Um, we do have some populations in southern Arizona that coexist with BD. And again, we don't know if this is related to genetics. There is some support for the hypothesis that, um, that there is some BD immunity um, with the MHC alleles, but it could also be related to climatic differences, um, you know, less severe winters in the southern part of the state. Randivirus um, is another question that we have. Um, we know that um, Ambisoma tigrinum virus, ATV, is a type of ranavirus that is endemic to Arizona. Um, we've not found FD3, which is the ranavirus that's caused mortality in ranids in the east. Um, we've had some frogs from the wild test positive for ranavirus, um, and it turns out to be an ATV-like ranavirus. Um, but we don't know if this is actually infecting the frogs or if it's just something in the environment. Um, so we are funding um, a researcher at Northern Arizona University to look into some of the seasonal dynamics of ranavirus within the range of Chiricahua leopard frogs. So despite the presence of disease on the landscape, we do continue to release frogs in the hopes that they will um, uh, be under some natural selection to allow for immunity. So again, our captive program is probably one of our, one of our most significant achievements towards recovery. Um, we're working with USGS right now. Um, they're analyzing our long-term data and reintroduction data, as well as some eDNA data to determine what factors are important in getting a frog population established when we do a reintroduction. So they're looking at things like habitat condition, um, number of releases at a site, and life stages of those frogs that we release. So we hope that this information will help increase the efficacy of our reintroduction program. Bullfrog removal um, remains one of those bumps in the road. Um, we've had a lot of success with bullfrog removal, um, but uh, continued bullfrog removal in southern Arizona is going to require persistent management of those buffer zones. We'll need to get more long-term funding to move areas that we have not done bullfrog removal yet. And um, we do have a lot of buy-in from private landowners already, um, but we um, will need to get more buy-in if we want to expand those removal areas. So, um, 
we do have a pretty extensive monitoring program. Um, we visit, you know, several hundred sites a year, um, but we don't have a plan right now that allows us any inference on their range-wide status. And so we're looking at implementing an occupancy monitoring program, which would allow us to detection probabilities and give us some idea of um, trends over time. Genetic management is another um, uh, item that we have planned. We've been working with the University of Minnesota Morris um, to look at some of the genetics of um, Chiricahua leopard frogs range wide. We know that we have small fragmented populations um, which can result in drift or loss of heterozygosity. And we also know that we have some populations that are bottlenecked because we know that they were started with just, you know, maybe 13 individuals. Um, and so we want to analyze the genetics range wise, range wide and figure out what are effective population sizes at different sites um, so we can prioritize areas that may need some genetic mixing. So in conclusion, um, these are my last couple of slides here. Um, I just um, reiterate how important our partnerships have been um, to success um, and, and where we've gotten so far. Um, we've been able to do, you know, really large scale projects as far as threat removal, habitat restoration, and captive propagation. And a lot of this has to do with all of the partners that we have and the amount of funding that we've been able to get through these partnerships. So this hasn't been a small scale effort. You know, we released tens of thousands of Chiricahua leopard frogs despite the presence of BD on the landscape. Um, and we've removed hundreds of thousands of bullfrogs and their tadpoles, despite some doubters that said that bullfrog removal um, couldn't be done successfully. And so we've been implementing most of these recovery tools for the last 15 or more years. It's taken um, quite a long time to get where we are, um, but we do feel like we're moving in the right direction. And something that we like to joke about in my program is, you know, maybe hope is a strategy. Um, we don't know why some sites have been successful and some haven't. Um, we feel like we don't have all the answers, but that doesn't mean that you can't do something successful, even, even if you don't have all the answers and even if it's not perfect. So I will leave it with that. And I think I hopefully have some time for questions. Um, my contact information is here, as well as Kat Crawford, the species lead for US Fish and Wildlife Service. Awesome, thank you. Uh, that was an excellent presentation and a lot that you were able to plug in there to about 40 minutes. Um, so we do have time for questions, which is good because we have a bunch of them. Hopefully we'll be able to get through those. Um, if you guys do have additional questions, you can feel free to put those in the chat box in the Zoom uh, meeting. So again, if you have not found it yet, you can hover over the window, see the chat bubble at the bottom, and you can go ahead and send your questions to everyone. And I'll uh, relay those to Audrey. So we have a few. Um, I'm going to try to uh, navigate these effectively here. Um, so I've got a mix of questions about bullfrog removal as well as some of the restoration efforts. So um, start here with a more technical one. So Audrey, uh, first question here is, are you using non-lead ammunition for bullfrog removal? You mentioned that you were using 22s, I believe, to kill the bullfrogs, but uh, can you tell us about the ammunition? Yeah, so um, in most cases, so we're working on federal land as well as private land for these removal efforts. And in most cases, we've moved to non-lead ammunition. Um, in particular, um, you know, uh, working with private landowners, um, uh, we are always really grateful when they want to participate in this and they are um, willing to give us access. And so um, in, in a lot of those cases, you know, they have very specific rules about um, when and how we're allowed to do shooting. Um, and often that goes along with, you know, the use of non-lead ammo, which, um, which we have a lot of. And the other thing is that, you know, shooting is definitely a really good tool that we use and very effective. Um, but shooting over and over again into sight, especially if it's at, um, you know, a, a tank that's on private land, um, can really wear on people if they have to hear that all the time. And so we do try to use other methods 
um, like I mentioned, hand capture, um, which can be really effective at night using a spotlight. Um, so shooting is just one of the tools that we use um, and we try to reserve that for adult frogs. Okay, awesome. Thanks, Audrey. Okay, uh, go to the next question here from Roy and the question, well, question here at the end. Uh, do you have any insights about the success rate of translocations and reintroductions? Uh, for example, the level of effort needed to successfully reestablish uh, Chiricahua leopard frogs at a site? You know, I, I wish we did. <laughs> um, and I think that, you know, the project that we're working on with USGS um, right now, that's, that's one of the questions that they're looking into is how many times, like, you know, we know anecdotally that it does take multiple releases at a site for there to be some success. Um, it, it seems like one of our limiting factors is um, definitely overwinter survival, which is likely related to chytrid fungus, um, since that is a, a wintertime phenomenon. Um, and so, especially in the northern part of the range, where um, we've had a lot of difficulty getting frogs to stick on the ground, um, we have moved to um, habitat that is more lodic or, or like spring fed, um, thinking that um, it has to do with a combination of dissolved oxygen and constant water temperature. So not having those, you know, really severe fluctuations of temperature um, because we know that chytrid um, does better when you have a really um, dramatic drop in water temperature. Um, and so having that constant water temperature is important, not just warmer water, but also like a constant water temperature. Um, and so, I mean, to answer your question, we, we don't know. Um, and I think, you know, we've really benefited by, um, I mean, I showed you guys the numbers, <laughs> the numbers of frogs that we released onto the ground and the number of translocations that we've done. Um, we're really fortunate to have such a large program um, and, to, um, and to really be able to do as much as we have, but we don't know, um, what those important factors are in getting frogs to become established. Okay, great, Audrey. And we have a couple other questions about uh, restoration components too that'll probably bring us back there. But uh, before we get there, um, a question about safe harbor agreements. Uh, the question is how many frog populations are included in the safe harbor agreement and role plans? That are included in safe harbor agreements. What was that last part? Enrolled lands, lands. Oh, enrolled. Um, ooh, I can't tell you off the top of my head. Um, we have 24 participants right now. Not all of them are active. Um, in other words, not all of them um, have habitat or have frogs. Um, but um, hmm, I would say um, more than half of them um, are are sites or are. are enrolled properties that have um, Chiricahua leopard frog populations and they serve kind of varying roles. So some of them, I think, like I mentioned, are more like passive um, safe harbors. So they might be private landowners that are adjacent to an area where we're doing conservation and we reach out to them ahead of time and say, hey, just so you know, you know we're gonna be um, doing active recovery in this area. I know you have, you know, water and habitat on your property. Um, uh, it may benefit you to enroll in our safe harbor program so that should frogs come onto your property, you would be protected from incidental take. Um, and so we try to, you know, reach out to those people and give them that option. Some of them decide that they don't, you know, they don't care if frogs come on their property. Some of them do appreciate having that option and, and enroll in the, in the program. Um, and so we have several sites that are like that, where the landowner and generally, you know, the ranchers, um, they want to have those assurances. We have other safe harbors that are more active participants. They, um, maybe they don't have any habitat on their property, or maybe they do, but they want to improve it. And they actually want us to go and release frogs onto their properties. And, you know, I can think of um, the, the Cave Creek um, meta population that we have in the Chiricahua Mountains. Um, that was, um, the reintroduction started there at the Southwestern Research Station, which was our first safe harbor in that area. And then, um, and then we enrolled, um, I think 12 other properties along Cave Creek, um, just 
downstream from the research station. Um, and those were properties that, um, that didn't have habitat necessarily, like in the form of ponds. They were adjacent to the creek, but they didn't have any um, lentic habitat on their properties. And so through Partners for Fish and Wildlife um, and other funding sources, um, we were able to go in and, and create habitat for those safe harbors. And they were already enrolled in the safe harbor um, before we did those habitat um, creations. Um, so again, I, I don't feel like I answered the question. I don't have a number um, offhand of how many, you know, actually have populations. But ranch, um, we do have multiple sites that are um, on that property. If it's a smaller, like backyard habitat, it's just one site that's occupied. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> It's a tough question to answer on the fly. And uh, yeah, lots of good detail there about the safe harbor agreement. So appreciate that. Okay, um, there are there's a handful of questions here about restoration techniques that I'm gonna try to summarize here because otherwise we're gonna go in circles. Um, okay, so lots of questions about how to build, re restore a site in the long-term sustainability of the sites. So um, try to put these in order that makes sense, uh, but if we wonder, I'll try to edit a little bit. Okay, one um, is if one wants to build a site or restore a site, what habitat characteristics should you shoot for? Is permanent water enough or need to, do you need to do more? For example, complexity was mentioned. Uh, what's the best way to achieve that? So the first question is complexity. I'm gonna try okay. to another one here too um, and see if we can cover both. So. The second part of the same group of questions is, are there any specific vegetative components in wetlands that contribute to success or failure? And specifically, any non-native vegetation that should be detrimental? Okay, yeah, both of those questions are kind of related. Um, and actually, I, I had a slide um, in the presentation that um, was one of the challenges. I took it out last night because I realized my presentation was too long. But um, this is this is another question that we have. You know, we we don't have any um, metric of of how well um, these restorations have worked. We do know that most of them are occupied by Chiricahua leopard frogs, but we don't know what habitat char characteristics are important. And you know, of course, for for ranid frogs, um, we know that um, BD and frogs and the habitat all interact, um, but we don't know how. Um, and so we, we presume that having areas of shallow water um, for basking is important, particularly um, in the colder months um, so that frogs can emerge and warm up and maybe clear their BD infections, um, but we don't know that. Um, but when I say complexity, I am talking about things like having some areas that are shallow, some that are deeper, um, having the deeper water for, for cover, for, you know, jumping in, getting away from predators. Having that shallow water is important for breeding habitat. Um, you know, you can definitely see if you go to a site, um, the frogs they, they just like always have like one particular area of a pond or a wetland where they like to breed. Um, and generally that's like a shallow finger. Um, having cover is important, you know, when, when, I don't know if you guys have heard of Tom Biebighauser, he's uh, the founder of Wetland Restoration and Training, who I mentioned, um, and he's a former um, Forest Service hydrologist, and he creates amphibian wetlands across the country, um, but um, he really has a classic pond look where he, um, he goes in, he builds, um, generally tries to use the existing clay to create a dam. Um, and he likes to throw in, you know, downed woody debris into those ponds. And, you know, again, that's providing um, basking habitat as well as cover. Um, something else that I think is important is, is and this is anecdotally, but um, having that flowing water component, whether it's groundwater from a well or a spring that feeds into it, um, and, you know, that may, again, have something to do with dissolved oxygen, or it may have to do with, you um, the number of zoospores that can, you know, build up at a site if you don't have water flowing in and out of it. Um, but, you know, I, I guess I would just caution that I'm speaking, you know, really anecdotally. And this is something that I've talked about with partners and, and wanting to figure out, you know, how can, how can we build our habitats better? 
um, to allow frogs to survive over winter because of BD. Um, as far as like non-native plants, um, um, so one of the issues that we have is if you build that, that shallow water component, um, you will have a constant management issue with cattails and bulrush, bulrushes, um, particularly bulrushes. Um, and so you want to make sure that you do have deeper water um, where those plants can't become established. And just know that you're going to have to probably regularly remove um, cattails and bulrushes. Awesome. Thanks, Audrey. Um, there's just a couple more questions kind of related to this that we'll get to, but um, I think this this next question kind of sums it up. I mean, but you guys have had good success reestablishing, but there's still some questions, like you said, on uh, how to make and sustain uh, good habitat. So, um, I'll go ahead and field these and uh, see if you can add maybe a little more context and then we can move on to a couple other questions. So um, first one is, do you think the cattle tank habitat in quotes approach, um, albeit good for short term success, is a long term solution for the species? And for example, is the um, is it the habitat they're adapted to in terms of population genetics, ecological setting, etc? Or do you think it will require long term management, um, including bullfrog removal? Um, and I'll tie that into another question um, along the same lines uh, from somebody that studied endangered toads and frogs in Germany for several years and looked at the role of physical disturbance on habitats. And basically disturbed areas were essential. Um, so if the disturbance regime was removed, the frogs and to toads disappeared. Um, so you mentioned, that, of course, there are lots of outstanding research questions uh, still for the leopard frogs, but do you have anything you want to add on those two topics? Um, well, I would, um, I would say just to comment on, um, you know, the stock tanks, I think that um, they're good habitat for the short term. And I think, you know, thinking about it from a meta population standpoint, I think that they definitely contribute to a meta population because they're so like widely distributed. And, you know, we need to be managing the water in such a way that we, um, we have it, you know, on the landscape. Um, and, but I do think that, you know, getting back um, water in those lotic systems and removal of non-native species in those lotic systems is going to be important for the long-term recovery of Jericho leopard frogs. Um, because, you know, um, you know, they were found in, um, in spring-fed runs and cienegas and things like that. Um, they don't need that flowing water as far as habitat, but, um, but, yeah, I mean, I, I think that uh, the lotic systems are, are really important um, as far as uh, as far as providing suitable habitat. But I think just realistically from a landscape perspective, um, I think managing for a variety of habitats is important. Thanks, Audrey. Okay, I've got, uh, looks like more questions. We'll see if we can get through. Um, so the first, and I, I don't recall if this is something you mentioned directly in the presentation or not, but a question was, will you be using the work from USGS to inform the monitoring approach? Can you say that question again? My dog is barking. <laughs> That's okay, no worries. Uh, the question was, will you be using the work from USGS to inform the monitoring approach? And I'm not sure, um, who provided that question. If you want to unmute and jump on, you can feel free to, to say what you're referring to. I'll give me a second here. Hey, this, this is Lucretia Johnson with US Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, what I was wondering is, I just recently um, spoke to Brett uh, Sificus, and we were talking about um, work that he's been doing specifically on the Buenos Aires National Wildlife Refuge. And um, so he's been doing monitoring, as I'm sure you know, for um, a number of years, I think somewhere around 17 years. And he was just mentioning that he had um, really started to refine some of those monitoring approaches. And I just thought um, that might be where you would start to develop a solid monitoring program. Yeah. Um, so. The work that I mentioned in the talk, um, I, I think that we'll definitely use that 
not so much for the monitoring approach, but for um, how we do translocations um, and to try to refine, you know, the number of translocations that we do and where we do them um, and whether we do more egg mass releases or tadpoles or juvenile frogs that have been head started. Um, so that work right now is really targeted for looking at those translocations. Um, but the work that Brent has been doing on Buenos Aires um, has been in conjunction with, um, with Blake Hosick and, and um, a postdoc at University of Georgia, Paige Howell. Um, and so what they've been doing is, um, is occupancy um, using double sampling. And so they will go to a site and do two independent surveys. Um, and, um, and then in that way, they can get a detection probability. Um, and so that's something that we've thought about incorporating um, because one of our issues is we have, you know, so many sites on the landscape that we survey and it's really not feasible for us to get to those sites um, more than once a season. Um, and so we're trying to find ways that we can get at that detection probability without having to do repeat surveys. Um, and so something that we are implementing this season, um, just here at Game and Fish, not among all of the partners, is um, time to detection monitoring. So um, it's uh, based on a paper that came out in 2018 by Halstead et al. And so it's looking at um, uh, how long it takes for you to detect the species of interest at the site. And um, the paper said that it's really good for small sites, um, which generally we have, um, and species that are not rare. Um, so this is something that we're implementing this year and hopefully that will allow us to get at that detection probability. Um, because, you know, I, I kind of express like all of the things that we use our data for. It's not just, you know, counting the frogs of the site, but we also um, assess um, um, if dispersals have happened. So we go to sites that were not occupied and, and see if, you know, frogs have gotten there. Um, so newly occupied sites and we also make habitat assessments and we're also looking for you know bullfrogs um, and so in in refining our monitoring program i um i want to make us more efficient um but i feel like it's this optimal um level of like doing enough surveying so with, that we get you know a lot of that data that we're looking for not just the occupancy um but we're not spending a whole lot of time going back to a site you know three times in a year or within a season. Awesome. Um, and thanks, Lucretia, for being willing to jump on and clarify a little bit. I think that was very useful for us. Thanks for that. Okay, we're getting really close to the top of the hour here, so I'm not going to I'm not going to hold everybody uh, too too much longer. You can feel free to send us additional questions that we can can answer for you. You can feel free to email um, Audrey, of course, or any of us listed here, and we can help you guys make a connection. Um, but I did want to drop one more really easy question on you, Audrey, um, and I'm being sarcastic, of course. Uh, so um, the question here is, I think you mentioned that you focused your presentation on the more successful strategic elements of the recovery plan. Do you have any quick comments or lessons learned about the less successful strategic elements? Oh. Um, no, I don't. I don't know if Kat is on a line, um, and maybe she can comment. Um, but I don't. Um, I don't. You know, I I was not involved in the creation of the recovery plan, um, and so I don't know if maybe Tom um, has anything off the top of his head, and if he wants to, ju to jump in, Tom Jones, my supervisor. Um, but you know, I I don't have anything. Um, I think that it's a really good model to use if someone's going to be using uh, or, or writing a recovery plan for a newly listed species. Um, and I think, you know, the, the partners that have been involved now since I've been in this position, which has been the last four years, um, many of them were involved in um, the creation of the recovery plan and were at the table providing input back then. Um, so I think that it's, it's a really good model. Yeah, yeah, like, like I said, I Oh, go ahead, Tom. I jump in yep. for just a moment. Uh, this is Tom Jones. Uh, the only thing I'd add to that, Roy, is that um, 
I think the, the meta population and isolated robust population model that we've been trying to adhere to uh, may be flawed to some extent. It's, it's pretty difficult to, to try and match the requirements that are in the recovery plan. And um, for many years, Matt, are you still there? I am. Tom, I think we lost your audio if you're oh. there. Can you hear me now? Yes, <laughs> we can okay. hear you. I, I don't know how much you heard, but um, I think the, the meta population model um, is flawed. Mike Shreddle, who was leading the Rand Frogs project for many years, tried to get away from that and uh, put together more of a, an occupancy approach to, to monitoring. Uh, and understanding the, the landscape of recovery. Um, but that's, that's a minor issue. That's all I'd say. Yeah, and yeah, I would agree with that. And that's something that we've talked about quite a bit here. Um, and, you know, just going back to, um, you know, the mentality um, of, of doing those criteria um, with the isolated robust population was because of BD. Um, uh, to try to keep a population separate um, from, you know, dispersing frogs so that BD would not get into the system. Um, but it turns out that um, BD still gets into those isolated sites um, because of, you know, BD moves around from, from humans and from other animals, not just amphibians, or not just ranid frogs, and there might be other amphibians um, that can get to those isolated, robust populations. Yeah, Audrey, thank you so much for that, and thank you, Tom, for jumping in. Um, I know, again, we're cutting this one a little short in the Q&A, but we've had a great discussion here for over 20 minutes now, which is awesome. Um, I will say we're going to, uh, like Audrey mentioned earlier, we're going to have another uh, bullfrog uh, webinar probably in two months. So we'll have a chance to talk about some of these issues a little bit more in detail then again as well. Um, so with that, I think we'll go ahead and wrap it up since we're a couple minutes past. I did want to say thank you, everyone, for taking the time to join us. Uh, especially Audrey, that was a really awesome presentation and obviously gave us lots of things to discover there, uh, to discuss there at the end. Um, this webinar is being recorded um, and we'll make it available on the Desert Landscape Conservation Center YouTube channel. You'll be able to find the link on the website uh, that's here on the screen, desertlcc.org slash resource slash ccast, or you can find it by simply Googling uh, Desert LCC YouTube. Uh, if you did miss the previous two webinars on non-native aquatic species, uh, those recordings have been posted to the channel, so you can go back and take a look at those. We also invite you to join us on CCAST, uh, where we're soon to have several new case studies on non-native bullfrog control, as well as several other non-native aquatic species, um, including this work presented by Audrey today. So uh, we have the URL for CCAST here on the slide, and Alex, uh, if you can copy and paste that in the chat box so that people have access to it, you can find us there. Uh, we hope you'll be able to join us for the next webinar in July, when we'll host a second webinar on control of green sunfish, uh, which is the topic that we covered last month. If you're really interested in non-native aquatic species control, uh, you can feel free to contact me or Alex to find more about the aquatics community of practice that we launched uh, in the past month. So with that, thank you all for your time. Thank you again, Audrey, for the excellent presentation, and we hope everyone has a great day. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Audrey.